I can't remember a Christmas in living history that I haven't had a proper hysterical crying fit. Cooking! 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 All the expectations of people travelling a long way to have a good time. Why do we eat turkey at Christmas? It is so foul. It tastes of nothing. I have never, ever, nor will I ever, ever cook a turkey. Never mind about men being grumpy at Christmas. What have they got to be grumpy about? For women of a certain age, Christmas is one long, long, long list of shopping, errands, wrapping, cooking, fetching and carrying that starts in mid-September and lasts till you get the house back to normal again on January the 4th. You're bombarded with endless, terrifying articles called The Countdown to Christmas. And there it is, in glorious Technicolor. How to make sure it's stress-free. Yeah, right. And struggle as you might, you get sucked into it. It's your life sentence for the next three and a half months. Everybody starts, don't they? December the 1st, you've got a list. And then you panic. Oh, you add more people to the list. You've got the list. Your other half never has, does anything to do with the list. I am a firm believer in the list. And I make a list, and I put initials next to each thing. Who's supposed to do what? And heaven help anybody who touches my list. You just become like a mad woman. And I hate it. And every year I say, I am not going to become a mad woman. And every year I do. The sheer scale of Christmas preparation for grumpy old women is enough to scare the festive boxer shorts off any man. You write out all your menus from Christmas Eve to Boxing Day like Delia does and prepare enough food for an entire army. You're marinating or drizzling or poaching and it's all got to be bought and ordered and picked up. Military campaigns would be easier. Well, because I'm officer in command of the list, I get to keep the fun jobs. I think there are West End productions that actually are done with less preparation than Christmas and probably less expense and last a bit longer. I mean, all this fuss is only a day. The lead up to it, I mean, I wash my curtains, I wash sofas, I have all the cushions of the sofas. I, I mean, I, it's like a spring clean or sometimes even decorate. Although I don't want Christmas to begin till December, I do spend three months preparing for it and then I spend three months debriefing from it. So there's actually only six months in the year when I'm not thinking about Christmas. I'm getting upset now. I can remember when the Christmas decorations went up on Christmas Eve, when you got Christmas carols the week before Christmas, that was when your nativity plays were done as well, and Christmas occupied the Christmas period. I used to be the 12 days of Christmas, now it's almost the 12 months of Christmas. Shopping at Christmas is beyond horrible. Everyone's frantically trying to get it all done, getting in our way and holding us up. We literally shop till we drop, getting all impatient and hot and bothered and cheesed off. Why can't everyone else be fitted with brake lights and indicators? The first list of presents is long enough to go on to two pages. And as the big day gets closer, this list will get longer and longer. Presents for your kids, presents for your mother to give to your kids, presents for his mother, presents for his mother to give to you, presents for Uncle Bill who doesn't really like presents, presents for your cousin in Sydney. Then someone at work gives you one and you have to buy one back. It's all got to be lugged about or put in the car and taken home and ticked off the list. What happened to retail therapy? I'm a Jew at Christmas, it's an anachronism, isn't it, really? So, you know, when we had kids, then the whole problem is triple because we are totally indulgent and we don't have the backing of being, you know, orthodox, right? So uh, Hanukkah now stretches over as many days as it needs to get to Christmas. Christmas is just terrifying. So I, I have started Christmas shopping in January. I do a bit then and a bit later in sales. But I do some, and I have a Christmas present book because I write down what I bought. Otherwise, I'd, I, I'd forget and buy two things for the same person. <laughs> for me, the pressure to get sort of Christmas organised and done with starts in about February and then leads up to October. And then I like to have all my presents done by October. I don't want to be doing anything in the shops come November. I don't want to be on Oxford Street on Christmas Eve looking for sort of, you know, a boob tube for a nine-year-old. 
uh, and you can get them. You cannot live in this country and not get involved unless you do what some of my friends do, which is go away to a sort of, um, you know, University of the Third World week and they go and learn stuff. And I've often thought about it, but <laughs> I get dragged instead into Harvey Nichols like everybody else. With only a month, 25 shopping days to Christmas, London stores are already crowded. It was so much easier for our mothers. Time was when children were thrilled with one thrifty present. A doll, a teddy, a jolly exciting stocking full of tangerines, a sixpence and a bunty annual. We were just so very much more, well, grateful really. Although I do remember wondering why Father Christmas gave me more than my mum and dad did when I'd only met him once in his grotto. Night like for Christmas, a machine gun and, and a P.C. Dixon's outfit, a train set. A little girl for a train set? Mm, big car. Mm. Big car. How big? Did you get that letter? Well, you'll be a good girl, won't you? Yes. Right, uh, well, bye bye then. Bye-bye. That's it. There you are. I don't approve of the whole game where you pretend to children that there is a person who is going to come and bring them things if they're good, all that crap. Um, I don't approve of the invention of this bogeyman who knows about you and knows whether you've been good or bad and so forth. I think all that's unfair. I think lying to children is despicable. Father Christmas certainly has so very much more to buy these days. Never mind an etch sketch or a painting by numbers set, some first class tickets to Disneyland and a top of the range laptop with DVD player is more like it, thank you very much. Then some ghastly craze starts and the kids write off to Santa for this year's hideous must have toy and you'll have to remortgage the house to buy one. I have had some awful Christmases, looking for a Tracy Island, looking for a Power Rangers. My daughter was, I absolutely have to have this Tamagotchi. And it was ridiculous. It became like the, the parental grapevine. My friends would be able to go, they've got Tamagotchis at Toys R Us. And I'd be in the car going, ah, and I'd get there and go, we just sold the last one. And it'd be like, no, no. Have you reordered? Yes. When are they coming in? February. No, no. Back in the car, off somewhere else. There's always one toy that one of your children want that seems to be the flavour of that Christmas. You know, like maybe it's a doll that wets itself or a certain, I don't know, a wrestler or something for Louis or, or there's always one thing that you can never get. else seems to be taking the preparation at all seriously. Your grumpy old man seems to neatly sidestep all this precision planning. You hand him a list, all neatly written out of the presents he needs to get, cards he needs to write, and he doesn't seem to take it on board. For some reason, he is able to just get on with real life, get on with his job, all through December, and lead a normal existence until about lunchtime on Christmas Eve, when he scampers round the shops and throws some things into the boots of the car. Even then, he saunters back looking very pleased with himself, with only a couple of flimsy little bags to show for it. Men have got no reason to be grumpy at all because they don't have to do anything. They really don't have to do anything. In fact, my husband goes out on Christmas Eve to buy my present. He's had 364 days of the year to go and get it, and he goes on Christmas Eve to buy my present. Buying presents you, is a gift. You either have it or you don't. Now, you know, my beloved husband, he just, it was agony for him. It wasn't worth seeing him going trudging off up the street, you know, with his overcoat all flapping. It wasn't worth it. And coming back with something that I'd have to take. But, you know, and my son the same. I say things like, I've got to buy my sister, my brother-in-law, my nephew, the cleaning lady, the secretary, this, that, and, that. and they just look at you incredulously because all they're going to do is buy your present and they're in a complete state about it. My husband's favourite, he was going to be, what have we bought for so-and-so? And I go, well, I've bought whatever, but I've got no idea what you've bought. 
always that, you know, and he asked me that on Christmas Eve. So if I did actually turn around and say, well, I've not bought anything, we'd be up shit creek. Delia and chums are topping up the pressure with their marvellous kitchen ideas that make it all seem like falling off a homemade Christmas log. They make it look so simple, so straightforward. I mean, how hard can it be? So instead of just nipping out to Mark's to buy it all, we decide to be perfect examples of organic feminine loveliness and make our own. Like we didn't already have enough to do, it all has to be so blooming perfect, so utterly eye-catching and delicious and gobsmackingly festive. But as usual, we're multitasking in double figures, and while the domestic goddesses have got it all sussed and pre-labelled and pre-frozen and picture-perfect, acting like bossy form captains, the rest of us are lagging behind horribly. There isn't much time left now. Very soon, we're all going to be sitting round that celebratory Christmas lunch table. You either love it or you dread it, but it's just around the corner. And every Monday for the next four weeks on Good Living, we've got essential reminders for what you should be doing to make the run-up to Christmas a little less stressful. What could be less stressful than making your own festive cupcakes and glazing Brazil nuts? On top of being a sexy domestic goddess. Hello? One of the things about Christmas that drives me absolutely crazy and in my opinion is probably the biggest problem is this mommy martyr that everybody wants to become at Christmas. Every woman wants to be, you know, Delia Smith or Nigella Lawson. Yes, well, I do think Nigella Lawson has done us a terrible harm, as has Delia. I mean, I've got all the books. And, I, and they all say different things. I mean, Delia is very reliable. She does give you very good timings. But some of them don't even mention the timings. And if you're such a bad cook as me, and then I get over ambitious. Nobody's making you do it. This is just something you've decided you want to be a martyr. Well, then shut up about it. I don't want to hear about it. If you want to sit there and string popcorn together to decorate your tree and make your mince pies yourself, why do you want to do that? Don't complain to me. It's a day, but it's all got to be perfect. The stress, the pressure, it's got to be perfect for this one day. The school play playground is, is uh, you know, a nightmare leading up to Christmas because you do get these mothers whose complete raison d'etre in life is to make everything perfect, you know, and they'll sort of do the Delia thing and they'll sort of come up and say, oh, um, you know, De since Delia mentioned it in her book, I haven't been able to get hold of uh, any ground mace. And I'm like, ground mace? Isn't that what you spray in the face of rapists? <laughs> then the house has to be made all full-on festive. Said goddesses have spent all year fiddling on with dried flowers and walnuts and pine cones and sprayed them gold or something. They've made lavish festive room focus points and twinkly centre decorations for the table and huge holly-laden garlands that twirl round the banister and generally make the rest of us feel inadequate. No pressure. Obviously, I make my own Christmas garlands. You know, and it's, I've always got one of those ones going up the stair that, uh, you know, the staircase, nice sort of wrapped around the banister, lovely dried fruits and, you know, sprayed apples, spray mounted onto card all around the house. Yeah, right. There is a cult of Christmas where people start sort of um, choosing a theme in October, saying, I think I have a tartan Christmas. And then they sort of make their own decorations for the tree and maybe spray some walnut silver and all that sort of thing. Well, when you've, when you've got a life, those kind of things sort of slide away to insignificance. You just think that, I used to make my own Christmas cards, but I was unemployed. Then people start sending you their wretched Christmas cards that are supposed to be cheery and festive, but just get you in a bad mood filling up the house and making more clutter. And you're writing pointless messages in cards to people you don't see from one year to the next. My Christmas card list. It's just terrifying. I have to print the labels out on the computer now. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll never get them done. And that's the other thing. I have to start them in about October. I always say I'm not going to send Christmas cards. And I sent, we got about 500, and I sent back about 500 last year. And I was sitting there till midnight. I like a Christmas card. I do like Christmas card because inevitably when people come around your house during the festive season, um, compliments of the season, 
Uh, they have a look around. If you've not many cards, what does it say about you? It says Jenny No Mates. You get Christmas cards from your building society. Like a, a crappy Christmas card with everybody's photocopied names signed in it. It's like, do me a favour, just, you know, just give me a quicker service when I come in and want some money. I don't want a bloody Christmas card. The ones from people are fine. The ones from organisations really piss me off. I'm, I get a Christmas card from the firm I once bought a sofa bed from. And it would hurt Merry Christmas Jermaine from All at Slumber Soft. I don't want Merry Christmas from All at Slumber Soft, thank you very much. And should you send the Coens a card because they do Hanukkah? And will the Chowdhury's want one or not? And should you do Happy Holiday cards instead? It's madness. Then some people send cute homemade ones that cover the carpet in stupid glitter or don't stand up properly. And they all have to be displayed and dusted around. And then there's the people who send you ones with their own beloved photos on the front that effectively say, we are all so smug and happy. Or say, we're on a yacht and you're not. Or, we're rich and you're not. Where's the Christmas cheer in that? I do Christmas cards, which I just do a photograph, and usually it's a photograph of me looking a complete and utter prat, and I send that to people, and people might say it's a big ego trip, but I think it's just taking the piss out of myself. I love Christmas cards, and I make my own Christmas cards, and yes, our Christmas cards are a photograph of our family. I think that's very funny when uh, people make the effort to dress their family up as... Um, I forgot the names. Jesus and Mary, that was it. And, uh, no, who, Jesus' dad. <laughs> William and Mary. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Joseph. I totally forgot his name. I forgot <laughs> Jesus' dad's name. I know some people that hand make Christmas cards, hand make their children's party invitations, and all you're thinking is, that's a Stepford wife. What really gets my goat are people who complain about, oh, it's naff to send homemade Christmas cards, it's naff to have Christmas cards with photographs. You know why? That's because you don't know your way around a glue stick and you're probably not attractive enough to take a lovely photograph. That's my thoughts. Still, men can be relied on to look after one thing. The Christmas tree. But boy, do they make such a drama out of it. It takes them hours to get it in and out of the car. Then they drag it in the house and scratch all the paintwork and spread the needles everywhere and generally make a dog's dinner of it all. Sometimes men can be such girls. His hunter-gatherer thing at Christmas is he has to buy the tree. I think he, in his mind, thinks he's actually gone out and felled it himself and he sort of comes back, you know. And we have the same palaver every year. He always buys a tree that's too big for the room. Every single year, without fail. So we have this complete sort of routine where he brings the tree in. I take the children out, remove them from the building altogether, hopefully, because the language is so appalling. And he just, Basil Fawlty style, starts hitting it, kicking it, giving it a damn good talking to, before then soaring about three feet off the top of it. So we always end up with this wonderful tree that's sort of that shape and then completely sawn off at the top. And of course, nowhere to put the, the, the Christmas fairy. We never have a fairy. We let the kids decorate the tree and then when they've gone to bed, we take it all off and do it again properly. We won't tell them that though, I. <laughs> I mean, they just basically throw things at the tree <laughs> and we'll see where they land. Once he's got it standing up relatively straight, the kids spend a magical three minutes squabbling over all their favourite Christmas baubles and bangles. And everyone says how they love a real Christmas tree, making you feel like a right party pooper. But guess who's hoovering all the needles up for the rest of the year? Not many grumpy old men, that's for sure. 
my mother hates the tree so as soon as I get the tree I get it as early as I can because I really like it and I like the smell I like the decor as soon as it comes into the house she's in a raging fury because she hates it because we're not meant to be doing Christmas because we're Jewish but she always used to do it she always used to have a tree and I always used to have a pillowcase full of presents but now some reason or other she doesn't like it anymore I get completely obsessed with getting the tree right and you you have to have two Nurofen plus half a bottle of champagne you get out all your balls you get out your tinsel you get out your lights you do the tree and it always falls over then you're supposed to be looking your best drop a dress size on top of everything else easy for some reason it's the season to look sexy except that you've gone from hot pants to hot flushes mind you the only thing you've been invited to is the coffee morning at the WI or the PTA disco. Great. And anyway, high heels drive you mad. You're so used to comfy shoes that they make you walk like Dame Edna or Dick Emery. It's just not fair. The dreaded office party comes along. And some bright spark puts out the twiglets and some tinsel. And you sit at your desk trying to get your work done drinking wine that would double as paint stripper. You have to try to be all festive against all odds. And all the blokes in the office start chatting up some young thing <laughs> who flicks her hair back and makes you feel fat and faulty. You could give her a big smack, kick her heels from under her. Sometimes it's just hard to be a woman. What really annoys me at Christmas parties are those young women who dress up as sexy Santas or sexy Santa's elves and I can't just can't be doing that you know it's that sort of combo of the Christmas hat and a little sort of red thing and then stockings and it's because I can't get away with it anymore you see, so I won't go I think Christmas parties are best left to the under 30s because you know you can't compete and all those blokes you work with their eyes light up the minute, you know, some gorgeous bird with a bit of cleavage and a bit of a short skirt and high heels appears at the party, you might as well give up. And I only get the hump, so I don't go. Office parties are, of course, a living hell. Uh, but because everyone knows that, it's fine. You just abandon hope all ye who enter here, really. All these girls in these outfits that are too tight, too low, too short, in shoes that don't fit, trying to hit it off with guys who they don't like, men who are married with the tie loosened, drunk and dribbling, trying to squeeze some girl that they've been grinning at all year. Then you have the people with their trousers off trying to photocopy their body parts on the Xerox machine. Oh, no, 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 no. Does anybody enjoy parties? I've, I've said this to lots of people, you know, I don't like parties, and everybody else says, no, neither do I. You know, I spend all day with these people, I don't want to sort of go out all night with them as well and get completely mullered, because you always do, you have to, you have to drink to get through those things. And then you always get some larry bloke who comes up and goes, oh, you never talk to me in the office, and you think, no, because I don't like you, and I don't like you now, so go away. There's always a point where it starts off being excruciating, then you become drunk enough to actually enjoy it, and then at roughly, it's usually about 1am, you can't remember what happens, and then you get home at 5, 6 o'clock in the morning. The lost, the lost hours, it's all a blur until somebody very kindly in the second week of January reminds you, probably by round robin email. Then the invasion starts. Your house is no longer your own. Your mother arrives. She who must be obeyed moves in with her own idea about how things should be done, keeping an eye on you and generally pulling rank and scrutinizing Operation Christmas in minute detail. It wouldn't be so bad if you weren't slowly but surely turning into a nice. And how long she's staying for God's sake? Judging by the number of bags till about Easter, she's everywhere, sees everything, nothing goes unnoticed. It's all making you irritable already and there's still days and days of it to go. I've eliminated a lot of the very, very worst things about Christmas from previous experience. Like, I've eliminated relatives. I live, well, my mother eliminated herself by dying, so that took away a big problem. 
uh, because there's always that thing with your mother isn't there about do you come to her does she go to you how many hours is she going to be in your house and you know that she's going to creep around with that finger out seeing where you've dusted and not dusted i mean the times i used to catch my mother coming down the stairs doing that not that she does a fat lot to help. These days she's got more leisure time and more disposable income than you do. I thought old people were supposed to be helpful. They don't even knit anymore. Then there's all the family feuds that are brewing. Someone in the family who's in a huff and a puff about who's going where and who's invited and who's not. Every year I say to my family, we are not going to get in a panic. You can go to your various in-laws if you want to. You don't have to come to me. And of course, always at the end they are torn into shreds because they should be seeing his mother or his sister or something somebody always has a row one of the things that i do not understand is grown people who sit around complaining that they have to go somewhere for christmas they have to go to someone's house that they don't want to i don't care who it is i don't care if it's your mother your mother-in-law whatever it is if you are over 21 and you don't want to go then you don't go nice things about Christmas. The one thing grumpy old women do get a bit soppy over is the nativity play. We go to watch the little darlings holding baby Jesus and being the three kings and singing songs that we sang when we were little. And all the stress and anxiety comes out in one big gush of hormones and emotion. Any child doing anything will make me cry because there's something so sort of sweet about it, but particularly singing, you know, little donkey carry mary <laughs> they're all doing that and then you go because <laughs> half the time you try not to laugh as well because they're like on the dusty road <laughs> you're going half the time you're going mustn't laugh mustn't laugh and then you go mustn't cry mustn't cry because they go why are you crying mama but even this harmless piece of tradition can be stressful underneath the tea towels and the tinsel there's been a long hard lobby to try and get your child a decent part like mary or joseph or the narrator winning the x factor would be easier my daughter was chosen as mary a couple of years ago which was just Oh, I was just like, oh, you've got to be Mary. I never, I never, ever, ever got to be Mary because my mother always gave me real sort of, you know, Oliver Cromwell haircut. So I was never going to be Mary in a million years. And I think the closest I even actually got to the crib scene, I was a blade of grass that sort of stood to one side. I was sort of stood there like a runner bean dressed from head to toe in green. I remember very well one year thinking that the Virgin Mary was in the bag and um, being a shepherd, being cast as a shepherd, which was distressing because there were scores of angels. I could easily have been an angel. I will break into primary schools just to watch one. Um, I mean, it's, and I like, you know, I don't want all this sort of non-religious one. I want Jesus and Mary, and what's his name? The, the dad guy. I want shepherds. I want somebody on all fours being a sheep or a donkey. I don't, what I don't want to do is make the costume like there was any choice miss sends a letter home saying that everyone has to come in with their homemade costumes the following day and could parents make sure that the halos stand up properly and the angels have to have proper flapping wings and it all has to be in by tomorrow then miss sends another letter home about all the charity appeals Everyone has to send things in for the tombola and the auction and the raffle, as well as the tray bakes, and on and on it all goes. People are using the tombola box to sneak in rubbish from the pantry they've been wanting to get rid of for ages. Some of the tin fruit and bath salts have been doing the rounds for years. One of the greatest things of, of getting old and subsequently more cantankerous is that I've just learned to say no to people. I don't actually care what they think you know they might go away and go oh she was terrible you know she wouldn't help us with the the school christmas tombola i could live with that i would rather have them think like that of me than be running around like a headless turkey and then you've got to hand in all the charity shoe boxes that you decorated and labeled up you try to feel spiritually uplifted full of christian spirit but it's a struggle i think the people that enjoy christmas much the most now are the people who are religious because it is a religious ceremony and i think the people that go to midnight mass and possibly go to the christmas day service actually do have a lovely time because it's a time of community getting together i hate the commercialization of christmas 
Uh, but even more than that, I hate the way that Christmas has now become politically correct. You know, in the Midlands, it's become the winterval. You know, it's not Christmas anymore. It's the winter winterval. The last time I went to church, I got there a little bit late, and I had to sit at the back by the crash. It was fucking hideous. I had the children all around me playing with toys all through the service. Not a maternal animal. Eventually, the food shop can be put off no longer, and you buy so much food you need two trolleys. One bleak early morning, you go to the supermarket for one big almighty shop, and you get there nice and early to beat the crowds. Think again. You do the kind of shop that dwarfs all 52 weekly shops rolled into one. This is the thing where a lot of women wake up and go, I haven't ordered a turkey. I haven't ordered an organic turkey, okay? I'll get down to Sainsbury's now. It's half past five in the morning. I'll get there first. I'll just have the new delivery. I'll be fine. So you get to Sainsbury's and you look around and everyone's getting out of their cars in the dark in the car park. And we're all women of a certain age, you know, sort of trying to look like they're not wearing their pyjamas underneath their coats. And they all look at each other and they start realising, oh, there are 15 of us here. I wonder how many organic turkeys have arrived this morning. What if there are only 12? And that's when everyone starts doing the organic turkey trot, which is the walk where you're trying to look like you're just walking, but actually you're running. <laughs> These are very middle-class women as well, trying to do the walk run to the turkeys. But, you know, with that steely determination that comes of many years of playing hockey. And, you know, they will. You know, it'll bully off. Next year, you might bring a chieftain tank to mow everyone else down. And things are starting to run out. They're getting low on mince pies, turkey stuffing, and anything else remotely Christmassy, as other more organised women than you have already bought all the sprouts. So there, eh, this is war. You buy stuff that you would never buy at any other time of the year, so, you know, your Paxo stuffing, no, you've got to kind of have stuffing with, with myrrh, uh, because it's Christmas. You got the butchers for the kosher turkey, right? Like uh, everybody else in North London is just saying, yeah, I just thought I might have a turkey this week, you know, just for a change. Have you got any, any turkeys this week? You know, like, yes, yes, they've got hundreds of turkeys back there. Make it easy, pre-order your beast. And you think, oh no, and then you get there and they're going, oh no, we've got no record of your order. And they're going, you listen here! And because it has to be picked up the day before and all the vegetables, you can't do anything a week before, like, you know, I say, frozen canned vegetables is the way forward and just any old bit of sausages and stuff. I booked the turkey for collection on the day before Christmas Eve so I think this is the one day that I'll have to go. I'll collect the turkey at the same time. I won't have to go anymore just the one day but I but I forget something so I have to go back on Christmas Eve when it really is like the seventh circle of hell. You had scheduled to be sitting at home in front of the telly with your feet up by now but you still have last minute shopping to do. Is it any wonder that at Christmas your grump reaches its peak? By now you're so angry you could cheerfully liquidise anyone that gets in your way. Might be best for people not to get too close. The panic and the, the, in all of the shops leading up to Christmas is absolutely unbelievable. You think there's like the, the end of the world is coming so people have to store up and rationing and things like that because they're just like savages. It's just blind panic. It's about making sure there's something in the bag with that person's name attached, whether or not it's actually appropriate for them or their age or their interests or the fact that you've known them for 25 years. Um, become slightly irrelevant after about lunchtime on Christmas Eve, I think. That's the cut-off point. Which is usually, actually, as a woman, that's when you start bumping into the, the, the husbands trying to panic buy the present for the wife. Usually most r real proper women have actually got it kind of sorted out by then, but no, i am become an honorary bloke and um, I'm running around buying sets of lingerie for great aunts, which isn't necessarily appropriate. <laughs> The house is stuffed to the rafters with food. You can hardly navigate your way around the pantry. And every cupboard is bursting at the seams. The reindeer still have to be fed and watered, and there are stockings to fill, and presents to put under the tree. So, you get to bed in the small hours, 
but then the tyranny of the turkey takes over and you have to set the alarm nice and early again to get the beast in the oven. Everyone else in the family is sleeping soundly. Your grumpy old man is snoring so loud he's making a noise like the hedge trimmer, as usual, and you get started on the cooking. You've been defrosting the turkey since November, but it's still looking like it's got frostbite. But it's not like this round at Delia's. It's large enough to have its own passport, but only now does the sheer bulk of the beast become apparent. God knows how you're going to get it in the oven. Oh no good. You forgot to buy a big enough oven tray again. Marvellous. I don't really like Christmas. It's too much stress, too much work. But the good thing is you can start drinking early in the morning and that's allowed on Christmas Day for some reason. And then you can sort of see the rest of the day through in a haze. You buy ridiculous liqueurs or you open them and drink them that you bought in Marbella six years earlier that taste like terps. And I've got gangrene on the top. And you, 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 you know, you are mad, aren't you? It's like, you know, it's like after you've had a baby or the first night, you are mad. Visitors generally are bad enough, but more and more beloved guests arrive, preventing you from lolling about and putting your feet up. Then all the months of buying and wrapping presents is over in a flash. There's a moment of magic while everyone opens one or two things they like and the kids are having a ball, which is swiftly followed by filling the first bin bag full of rubbish. Possibly 40 minutes of Christmas pleasure and fun, giving presents to a small person and creating mess and watching things being broken and destroyed generally. And that's kind of relaxing. I think that's the nice bit. When your kids get old enough to enjoy their presents and stuff, then that's quite fun. My daughter got a, uh, a trolley, you know, a suitcase on wheels. She's not an air hostess. I've no idea why she'd want one. But she was absolutely thrilled with that and that was quite sweet. The toy packaging has been designed by a spiteful person who obviously doesn't have children of their own and whose bright idea was nailing down all the toys in their boxes permanently with industrial strength bolts. Thanks for that. They spend most of the day opening packaging uh, of their presents um, that they really don't want you to open because they've got like metal bolts and things in the back of things. Now have you seen what they do to children's toys? Just drives me to, I mean, insane. Still, people will have brought you lovely thoughtful presents. There are parcels under the tree with your name on to look forward to. Someone might have got you something festive yet devilishly stylish and to die for. After all, you're so easy to buy for, so easy to please. When you get to my age, it's pretty hard to buy a present for me. I wouldn't like to be anyone who had to buy me a present. I've got everything I need, short of a facelift, sex, and a big diet. And you don't, can't fit those in a parcel, can you? Let's be honest. <laughs> I loathe craft. Loathe and despise it. I don't want any hand-thrown anything. I don't want a set of cunning ceramic knobs to go in my non-existent decanters. Oh, thank you. Surely your mother can be relied on to get it right. Surely she will have got you something you wanted. Something to pamper yourself with or make you feel good. My own mother came up for some triumphant presents that were all, each present was a bit like um, a little nail or a little wound, you know, designed to inflict the maximum pain possible. My mother has given back to me a book I gave her that I'd written in. So I sort of went, that's the book, and she went, oh, sorry. One Christmas, I was going to the West Indies uh, for Christmas with my husband. My mother gave me a large box. It was very, very heavy. And she said, I have bought you a present that's so special. You've got to unwrap it on Christmas Day. You've got to take it all the way to Nevis. So I took it on one plane to Antigua and then on a tiny little fucking plane to Nevis. We got off, I carried this box into the hotel room on Christmas morning, I unwrapped it, and in it were two 
cut glass grapefruit dishes. The piece de resistance has to be a girlfriend of mine whose mother-in-law gave her a used soap on the rope uh, that had pubic hair in it. So, I mean, she could tell it had been used anyway because it was considerably less large than it should have been. Uh, it was reduced in size, not really proportionate to the rope. But it also had sort of, you know, when you've used soap for years, the pubic hair gets sort of embedded. That was nice. What is it with mothers? Never happy? Never satisfied? I thought they liked lavender soap and flannels and drawer liners. They're enough to make you strut around the place, slamming the door and stropping about and threatening to leave home like your own teenage daughter. Except there'd be nowhere to go at Christmas anyway. It's very nice, yeah. Very nice. I think old people serve quite a good function at Christmas because they'll always usually be the rudest or the most... You know, they're the sort of barometer. They're either asleep quite early on, snoring loudly, providing entertainment for the rest of the family, or they're kind of, you know, making their feelings felt loudly. My mother, you know, God rest her soul, she would be already, as soon as you gave her something, she'd be eyeing it up to see who she could give it to when they turned up and she didn't have a present for them. You could see the wrapping paper, the virtual wrapping paper going around the thing you just put. Oh, oh, lovely. Oh, I haven't got one of those. I... I don't really. Oh, but you know, you could see it was on its way to Doris next door. This is her tenth last Christmas. We've had, uh, we've had the fifth last Christmas, sixth, seventh, eighth, lots of last. Every year she wants it to be her last Christmas. So because it's her last Christmas, she says, if anybody behaves badly, this is my last Christmas and you've spoilt it. My mother has the Christmas face, which uh, my brother has inherited. Uh, my mother's Christmas face is one of seething resentment. My brother's is one of disappointment and right, sort of, what, you got me that? And, uh, you know, the, the first thing most people say in our family when you open gifts is, have you got the receipt? Your partner then, he'll have got you something really romantic, something for an irresistible sex kitten in her 40s. He couldn't make the same mistake as last year, surely. He wouldn't be stupid and do the canteen of cutlery, the pan set or the oven glove, again. With presents from your partner, size matters. The smaller the box, the more likely it is to be gorgeous jewellery. The bigger the box, the more likely it is to be some electrical gadget from Dixon's. Or a bread maker, or a fondue set. My husband, one Christmas, gave me a chenille hand-knitted bobble hat, which he still remembers to this day. I mean, it was like we'd never met. And so I opened it and I went, did you not like me when you bought this? And he went, no, I thought it'd be really fun. And I went, but for who? I used to collect frogs. Frog used to be a big thing with me. Don't know why, some people, pigs, elephants, mine were frogs. So I think I'm now in probably my 10th year of being bought frogs, and I'm now desperate. I wasn't even remotely gracious, and my sister was going, I can't believe how rude you are to him. And I said, so much better that it's honest now. Then I go, a chenille bobble hat. I've spent a lifetime pretending I like presents. I'm certainly not going to do it with my husband. I had, I think it was a bottom bra once, which is the most extraordinary thing. It was m maroon angora wool. <laughs> it was shaped like this, and then it had two ties. Now, what could it have been? I think it looked like a bottom bra. You had it under your bottom, hoist it up, and then tied the ties around your waist. We could, none of us could work out what it could have been. I've got frog sitting, lying, begging, frog paper, frog pictures. I was quite disappointed one Christmas to receive a... Um, I've never seen anything bef like it before or since, actually. It was a, a set of differently sized nail clippers. Um, uh, small ones for small nails and big ones for big nails and some of them were big enough for sort of horses hooves I don't know maybe it was actually some sort of veterinary thing and I've got a frog drawer frog handles um, and a lot of frogs in a drawer all asking to come out because I can't bear to look at them anymore so I, I would say to the world at large please no more frogs it was presented in a in a kind of red leather pochette so clearly the redness I mean this was a present bought by somebody 
uh, at five o'clock on Christmas Eve who thought, red, 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 Christmas. She'll like that. No, she didn't. It's one of the things about having been an adulteress all my life. Christmas is one time of the year when I'm left strictly alone because he's elsewhere attending to his family. So most of the men in my life would never have given me a Christmas present, I'm afraid, my misspent youth. We seem to get the brunt of everything at Christmas. Now we're properly grown up, stuck in the middle, neither young nor old, in a sort of in-between age. We're left basting the turkey and mashing the potatoes while everyone else is on their second dry sherry. And we're getting all hot and bothered and fed up. Is it me or is it hot in here? There must be an easier way. My Christmas mostly consists of waking up in the morning, getting all the packets out of the freezer, going <coughs> like that on the top and shoving them in the microwave. Um, well, I don't, I, I, I do actually cook the turkey, but the rest of it, all that, all the mashed potato and things like that, I just, I just buy it from the supermarket ready-made. I just think, well, you know, why wouldn't you really? The worst thing about the actual Christmas dinner is it all has to be done at once. You've got to have it all, the bread sauce, the cranberry sauce, the, the roast vegetables, everything's got to be up and perfect and great and, and it can all be completely thrown because you haven't got the oven on the right temperature so everything else is cooked in a bloody bird, you keep dragging it in and out. Have you ever tried to get a turkey out of the oven? very heavy. It's like getting a fat child out of a playpen. Once a year you need an industrial sized oven and once a year only. So and then that's just so annoying all the sort of you know the this on top and the that below and is that basting. Oh, 84 vegetables. I mean why Christmas Day is all about eating vegetables you never eat during the year. The beast is finally cooked and paraded into the dining room with a flourish. You seem to have calculated about three kilos of turkey per person and some of them are only teeny weeny kids. So never mind turkey curry, you'll be sending them all home with goodie bags and they'd better leave some room for the parmesan parsnips and cauliflower mornay that seemed such a good idea back in November. When your head's in the oven and you just think at that moment, you know, there's 12 people in there all laughing and opening things and you just think, I think I'll just keep my head in this oven for another couple of hours, that'll just get rid of the rest of the day and we won't have to watch Bruce Forsyth. They should do one, shouldn't they? A case, a great big pot noodle, so, you know, maybe a big tub, big bucket of pot noodle in Christmas dinner flavour. And you could just put that in the middle of the table and give everyone a fork, that'd be a great idea. Having put so many woman hours into the Christmas feast, you finally take your penny off, sit down at the table, and everyone just, well, eats it really. My father's mother would come to us every Christmas, she'd eat her dinner, she'd go through dinner going, just a very small portion for me please dear. How do you fucking hate relatives that do that? Just a small portion for me, dear, routine. No, I am very boring at Christmas time because I do keep on about how bad it was when I was young and, you know, how lucky you are. You've no idea what it was like during the war down the shelters and all this. So I'm awfully boring. I, I realise that. I can't stop myself. Again, it's sort of those awful things I find myself. And I, every year I say, now, come on, just get into the spirit of it, enjoy it. And I sit there getting sourer and sourer. I'm a pretty kind of sweaty host, actually. I'm always apologising for everything. Oh, these potatoes, you know. Oh, oh, sorry, no. When I did them before, I did... Mm, anyway, I was trying a new... Oh, okay, I'm a, yes, apologetic host. I remember once, my mother, instead of the gammon, she's got to have gammon, but one year she thought, no, no gammon, tongue. We'll have tongue. Well, she bought a tongue living in the north, raw tongue, have you seen one? Well, she kept it in the conservatory because she was too frightened to bring it in the house because it gave her nightmares. My brother found it, he chased me all around the house with this tongue, never been... <laughs> so that's, well, that becomes a tradition then, doesn't it? You know, you've got to have a raw tongue now to chase around the house because it's tradition. 
Once you're an adult, Christmas never really lives up to its promise. It all seemed so magical when you were little. Okay, so Tressie's hair didn't really grow and Santa turned out to be an out-of-work actor with bad breath, but now it makes us, well, more grumpy than usual. We all have memories, probably, of, of one or two, at the very most, great Christmases from our childhood, which, admittedly, we weren't having to cook. We just consumed. We consumed presents, we consumed food, we consumed snow and jollity and Santa, and it was all fantastic, and uh, we managed to turn a blind eye to the fact that our poor stressed parents and relatives were actually about to pass out. By the time, you know, it got to sort of carving the turkey, my mother, sort of slightly menopausal by this time, with an electric carving knife, not a good combination. You know, carving the turkey, but looking at all of us. You know, she could have gone for any of us at any moment. And I, obviously, because we all turn into our mothers, this is what has happened to me. You've spent most of December ricocheting between tears and throwing plates at people, some with food still on. And now you bring out the plate of homemade mince pies. And everyone looks fed up and like they can't wait to get back to some hair straightening or their computer games. And you're all supposed to be having such a jolly time. Families are a very interesting dynamic. You get a group of people in a room who are related to each other by blood and then you know that it's going to go terribly downhill. And of course you introduce any kind of wine, port, rum flavored eggnog, <laughs> whatever your background is, and it's all going to go downhill. People who haven't seen each other for the whole year suddenly find themselves in each other's company with no prospect of escape because Christmas dinner takes so long to get on the table. They're drinking and within a couple of hours the thing that everyone's been trying not to say gets said, the unforgivable thing. And then it's, in my experience, in my family, it would be on for young and old. There would be t tears well before bedtime, people running up and down stairs and doors slamming and all that kind of caper. Oh, please. And all, un all with party hats on. I mean, Jesus. What you've got to remember when you're seeing Christmas on an advert is these people aren't related. They're paid to be nice to each other, you know. Uh, and the reality of a proper Christmas family is, you know, bored te teenagers texting under the table. And there's always one trying to get drunk, really, really drunk. And then there's a, the coughing baby. <coughs> and then some old relative that's kind of lost it a bit. The worst thing about Christmas is the emotional turmoil and the guilt. Because, um... I'm crying at carols and I'm a Jewish atheist. I'm squandering all my money on luxuries, useless luxuries, and really half the world's got nothing and I'm meant to be a socialist. And then I'm eating and cooking turkey and I'm meant to be a vegetarian. So I'm just upset the whole time, really. I always think you're more susceptible to crying at Christmas and it's got nothing to do with actually what you're watching or what you're seeing or whatever. It, that's the catalyst for all the stress. So. When all your relatives arrive, you can't sort of go, oh God, all my relatives are here. So you channel it into something that you're watching on the telly. One Christmas, some girlfriends, a couple of girlfriends spent Christmas with us for some reason. And then the kids were playing with their toys and my husband was out of the room. And he came back to find three grown women sort of completely uncontrollable with tears watching, <laughs> watching It's a Wonderful Life. I'm going to cry now if I talk about It's a Wonderful Life. And... Uh, he goes, I thought you'd seen it before. And because we have. At Christmas, you probably remember the people that aren't with you anymore. But in my case, John was so ghastly at Christmas, I can't honestly say that I moved or miss him at Christmas time. I'm actually quite glad that he's not around moaning and grumping. But, of course, I miss him, per se. The grumpy old men seem to be oblivious as usual. They found some football on the telly and taken the weight off their feet. They lounge about like they do every Saturday afternoon, except that they don't usually have stupid paper hats on over their comb over. I become very feminist at Christmas because I do pretty much do everything. And, you know, my husband will only have to say to me something like, um, oh, you know, where's the brandy butter? And I'll go, and, and it would be like, well, of course, you wouldn't know where the brandy butter was because you never do anything around here, do you? It's always left up to me. You just sit around. Da, da, da. And he's like, all right, all right, love. Yeah, I, do, I do become a bit Linda Blair, you know, swivelling head and green vomit. Still, 
Some nice wholesome party games will cheer everyone up while some of the time away and we oldies can get even with everyone else and thrash them all at a game of old maid or pea sucking or charades. The kids look super fed up. These days children just don't know how to make their own entertainment. Seems a bit sort of pretentious and Nancy Mitfordish at your own home. Le time for games! The idea of sitting around in someone's living room performing for other people it, to me is just absolutely revolting. If I want to see entertainment, I turn on the television. I don't want people in my house entertaining me, thank you. Every Christmas we played a particularly weird game where we'd have to get behind the sofa, duck down and on some message or you know my father would shout a word my sister and I would have to put our heads up and our uncle Ray threw a wet flannel at us now I don't know anything about that game I don't know what it's called consequently I don't like games very much at Christmas I am a party game addict I'm afraid and that causes awful consternation I mean when when the children were young Richard Bryce and his family used to come around and and he and John used to go into the kitchen and get steadily more and more sloshed and more and more angry with me. And I would go into the kitchen and say, come on, come on, join in. You're spoiling it for everybody. My husband loathes them. And Christmas is the only time of the year when I, I, I can get him to play. Get, the rest of the year, he will not have it at all. He's not interested. And, uh, you know, at Christmas, I'm like, the children want to play a game. Because, of course, really, it's me, because I'm very competitive and I want to beat him. I like um, any of the games where you draw things out of a hat and you have to make noises. You know, yeah, anything, you know, shop snap. I'm, I'm good for anything. I'm a, I'm a marvellous guest. And I used to do an elaborate treasure hunt. And I remember once I put uh, a clue in the telephone box outside. The, it, the, the clue led them, it's terribly clever, led them to the telephone box. And then they had to ring the number and the answer phone would give them the next clue. Brilliant. Took me hours to set up. John nearly killed his father in this telephone box because they were in opposite teams and they got to the thing at the same time and John didn't have any money to put in and he was fighting his father to get the money off him. So it's often ended in tears, games. I enjoy them, but nobody else does. The kitchen looks like a bomb's hit it. The washing up mountain is higher than on any other day of the year. Goody. At least the dog's happy. You finally get a sit down and some serious lolling amongst the broken Barbie dolls and the PlayStation that doesn't fit your software. Still, next year it might be someone else's turn. Someone else will cop for all the work and the mess in the kitchen. And chances are it'll be another grumpy old woman. My sister and my brother and myself well, the two girls take it in turn. It's not my turn this year, it's our Sarah's turn. So, <clears throat> we can, I don't help, I pretend to, I, can, can you do with any help? But then what you do is, um, very carefully, you wedge yourself uh, in a place at the table which is impossible to get out of. You know, sort of, because they always have to put a bit, a bit of an extension at the card table at the end, you know, with the sheet on top. If you wedge yourself right at the back there, and you have to come get past loads of high chairs, and you, and you can't really, just, oh, I'd love to help. Do that. If somebody lands the Christmas Day slot and you're off the hook, you know, you know that they're suffering, and suddenly you become like their great-great-grandmother, and it is feet up on the coffee table, and, oh, yes, I'll have another brandy. And you know that they're suffering, and, and you know that you should obviously have some Christian spirits and probably go and help. But no, because you did it last year, and, ha, huh, they can suffer. You see, I don't relax at any time of the year, so the idea that I'd relax at Christmas, all those magazine articles, have a really relaxing Christmas. How to give yourself a stress-free Christmas. <laughs> the only way you can have a stress-free Christmas if you've got a mother or a father or a husband or a child or a friend would be if you were in a coma.